Devika Mehta. Uh, Devika is a research scholar at Jamia Millia Islamia Delhi and she is currently working on children's cinema as a genre in India for her PhD. Mm -hmm. And she is interested in children's literature and popular culture, especially how they construct and reconstruct ideas of childhood and the influence of media, globalization and consumerism on the world of children's literature in India and the world at large. And uh, she has presented papers at various conferences, including the previous uh, Nottingham conference. That so it's over to her. For <laughs> Uh, hello everyone and thank you so much for letting me present again and it's been quite learning experience since June and, uh, and uh, my paper is on the adaptation of uh, Ghulam Giri into a graphic novel by Sri Vidya Natarajan, uh, A Garner in a Wasteland and it's a close study of the graphic novel focusing mainly on the on the visuals and the images and the way uh, the words and images in, uh, have, have been used by the writer and the illustrator to adapt, appropriate, rework uh, not only slavery, Ghulam Kiri, but also Jyotiba's other ideas on caste oppression, on education, Savitri Bai's role in, and, uh, in, in the movement in anti-caste uh, uh, oppression. So, Graphic novels uh, uh, and comics always have a, a function in a, a tightrope between uh, being a commercially viable cultural artifact promising new turf for commercial exploitation, a linchpin of uh, new visual literacy and also working as a site of resistance where the interplay between words and images add to the dynam dynamics of the text. So they create a new discursive space where older uh, issues can be renegotiated and refashioned. So the use of innovative narrative technique, word image interplay, comic graphic art change the dynamic, dynamics of an older text, in this case Balaam Kiri, and they create uh, counter narratives that rework, revision and appropriate that older work for a contemporary reader, viewer. In this uh, case, um, in the paper, I'm going to look at this reworking and how the medium of the graphic novel has been used to transform a historical non-fictional work, giving it a new dimension by using different forms and modes of storytelling, such as the comic book format, using different comic book inventions, a comic strip, M and Atta, uh, and with the dialogue form, and along with Fusing different contexts, past, present, historical, contemporary, sometimes either being transposed on each other. The entire text uses images in various ways to foreground, extrapolate, and revisit Hule's Vilam Giri, and also to look at Dalit oppression and struggle for liberty, not only in the past but also in the present, contemporizing. Uh, uh, the ideas of slavery and uh, other uh, ideas of Jyoti Bakune. So uh, these variants uh, let one explore how these tales are rewritten to suit different sensibilities even as they engage with uh, thematic configurations such as caste oppression and all looking at education as a tool for resistance, looking at gender inequality, untouchability in tandem with contemporary cultural politics heightening the ideological underpinnings in the earlier text and also overturning the dynamics of the earlier tale which is uh, mediated by the appropriated work and also the appropriate work is mediated by the original text. So the, uh, what the writers have done is they've used the frontal piece of the uh, original work and have uh, uh, introduce their own uh, heading, the title, A Garner in the Wasteland. Now the next is, uh, these are uh, the four chapter divisions. And these are the images that they use and this in itself becomes a, 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 a very simple sequential, a single frame comic strip where it starts with the wasteland of caste, the weed uh, bed of myth, that's second, 
the third is roots of tyranny and finally the release uh, the seeds of change so using the entire graphic novel uses this imagery of gardening gardener flower and weed uh, the next is they use uh, various intertextual references along with newspaper cuttings and uh, references to contemporary events, other novels, other ideas, popular catchphrases, uh, idioms and uh, uh, I uh, ideas taken from uh, the cultivator's uh, whipcord uh, providing also a quasi-biographical account of Jyotiba Pune and Savitri Bai and uh, they do it in a comic strip mode also uh, with a journalistic overtone and uh, uh, introduce the original dialogue form uh, that is uh, present in slavery. And what is interesting is how they mirror uh, the, the text opens uh, with a frame narrative showing the writer and illustrator talking in a similar vein as uh, Jyotiba and Dhondiba talking in slavery. The same idea of dialogue and discussing the issues is used in both the frame narrative and the main, the embedded narrative. So, the first interesting point that they do in, in this uh, reappropriation is uh, Savitri Bhai's role and characterization. Now in these three images, they show Savitri Bhai's active role which is on par with Jyotiba Pule, something which is absent in uh, slavery. So slavery, uh, it only shows uh, the dialogue between uh, uh, Dhondiba and uh, Jyotiba and uh, his uh, preface and his ideas. But here, uh, her uh, presence in the anti-caste movement, in the fight for education and gender equality is shown. And it is again in the first frame, it is uh, shown in the mode of a comic strip with thought bubbles and uh, uh, introducing the speech bubbles and showing the, the illustrator sitting at her, at her uh, work desk and thinking about Savitri Bai and how she has uh, been, uh, how her absence has been uh, uh, a part of history being a non brahman thinker activist. The second frame again shows uh, 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 Savitri Bhai with Dhondiba cutting the weeds and these weeds are of slavery and oppression again drawing in an, uh, uh, a parallel between uh, black slavery and caste oppression. The third is uh, Savitri Bhai beckoning, beckoning the reader and the viewer to come and listen to the dialogue between Jyotiba and Dhondiba discussing uh, um, uh, the, uh, the coming of Aryans, debunking the myth of caste origins and other and uh, ideas of Manuskriti. Uh, again, in a typical comic strip mode, uh, it's uh, uh, the mm -hmm. The two panels are placed together on the same page with Savitri Bai in the, in the, in the upper panel and uh, Dhondi Bai in the lower panel where uh, she is talking about liberty and fight for liberty and is shown in a very aggressive actant mode while in the lower panel Dhondi Bai is talking about the influence of Thomas Paine and his works on his ideas. Here in the next uh, slide is again the views of, uh, it's trying to contemporize and to uh, use the popular modes of expression of liberty, fraternity, equality and using different slogans and different figures of fought for liberty and uh, this uh, first image of the lady, uh, the struggle for, that's a very popular icon of liberty with the uh, bare breast of the lady holding the flag and fighting for liberty and in the bottom of the panel in the left hand side there is Irom Sharmila uh, Irom Sharmila's uh, figure and all of these uh, popular catchphrases that are used in uh, in a very uh, uh, these phrases can be used on t-shirts and on mugs and they have been uh, fused 
in this entire narrative of fight against oppression and uh, caste oppression and fight for equality in uh, the narrative of slavery and Jodhiva's ideas. This uh, is uh, this analogy between uh, black slavery and Dalit oppression. Now, in this image, what we have is uh, the uh, how the Brahmin and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the the white master of the black slave have been uh, interlinked, and uh, especially the cent the central image in the first uh, uh, photograph. Uh, where they have been fused together. So it's difficult to make out one from the other and uh, the other aspect is the violence shown here of the tapping of the tongue with Manusmriti being shown at the bottom and this entire uh, sequence of uh, the uh, tongue cutting if you read the Vedas, if you touch the Vedas. On the other um, uh, frame you again have uh, as, uh, in the upper panel, we have Dhondiva uh, talking about the oppression and slavery, and in the lower panel again, uh, the uh, the condition of the black slaves. Now, in the the other part of the entire graphic novel is how they uh, use images to debunk the myth of origin of caste. A Varna system in a satirical mode using humor and to under, undercut its revolutionary potential. And uh, what they do here is there is a clash between the modernizing aspects of the adapted version and the conventional setting and maybe work to disrupt the expectations of the viewer, thereby raising issues related to femininity, oppression, and marginalization, among others. Two diverse sensibilities. Uh, mythic schemata and popular. Okay, it seems I forgot to add that slide. Okay, uh, I just explain. There is this slide in which what they do is it's it's a scene taken from uh, from a mythic representation of battle between uh, Dalits and Aryans or the uh, native Indians and Aryans. And they are shown carrying guns, tanks, hand grenades in a very, uh, uh, in a popular film kind of a uh, narrative that is being shown there. They, uh, their dress and their appearance and the battlefield is a part of a mythic habitus and on that has been transposed the popular uh, articles like guns and uh, nuclear weapons. So two diverse sensibilities are brought together which posit an alternative perspective on how an individual constructs one's world and represents one's lived experience, pointing out the continue, continuity in Dalit oppression right into the 21st century. The consequences of appropriation of tales by mass media is also reflected in these images and how the graphic novel tweaks and realigns the elements of the original, blending it with new genres across mediums to recreate a new storytelling experience. So here, in a manner similar to contemporary retellings of myths and fairy tales, the subversive quality of the text interacts with the lines of typical marketing gimmicks that create a popular text and convert it into an established fictional work world or network with its own set of constituent elements and a hybrid habitus one where the new and the old are combined and are in a constant state of flux. Using elements of parody, humor and caricature, here in this uh, case, uh, Brahma's story from Jyotipa's perspective, this adaptation uh, retells and reworks the tale of the origin of the four Varnas from the mouth of Brahma visually and verbally thwarting expectations of the viewer at the outset, overturning the tail on its head uh, by its use of images and the way uh, Jyoti, Jyoti by the end says that the story is full of holes, which is being again uh, uh, visually represented in the case of uh, Brahma. And uh, the use of sanitary napkins and the idea of the menstrual bleeding and how uh, if uh, 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 
the car, the Varna system was born out of Brahma's uh, 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 mouth or holes in this case. How? Uh, in a very satirical mode, they debunk the entire origin of caste system. In the next case, again, using a discrepancy between ver verbal and visual narrative, this uh, show how set patterns are used as a smokescreen to thwart which uh, viewers knowledge of the original tales and to create an element of suspense, recreating a new narrative variant, challenging ideologies, earlier ideas of uh, hero and villain, um, concepts of other and deviance, the idea of beauty. And here, uh, notice that the habitus remains the same, but the perspective changes. So what you have here is the Narsimhan Hiranyu Kashyap myth with uh, uh, the Vaisal an avatar and uh, Hiranu Kashyap is the villain and here uh, visually they uh, overturn that entire concept, that entire construct of what is a hero and who constructs a uh, hero and heroism and how one uh, constructs this idea of deviance in a mythic uh, structure. Again here the idea of beauty, construction of hero and villain in a mythic format and how verbally reusing uh, the language of a popular narrative and uh, slang and abuses and visually they are representing uh, uh, characters from uh, myths debunking this idea of how uh, foolish sees uh, the same characters and how a Brahman's perspective has been put up. So you have uh, a, a Parshuram, you have Vaman and how again uh, the constant interplay between uh, the images and the words uh, amplify and extrapolate Jyotipa's ideas here. This again in a very different uh, 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 use of a comic strip can be a mode of uh, narrative. There is a minimum usage of words and it's just trying to show the transition of how Brahmins uh, manipulated uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the primary education policies and how uh, initially it's just the Brahmin being shown in his uh, traditional garb in the spotlight followed by the Brahmin gradually in the next two uh, being dressed as in, in, a, in a court and uh, in the end being reduced to a creature who manipulates and puts this idea of how not to let reforms reach uh, uh, to people lower down in, the, in, in society. Again here minimum usage of words but visually describing a uh, hunter commission showing both Jyotiba and Savitri Bai. Throughout the uh, novel, graphic novel, Jyotiba and Savitri Bai are uh, given uh, equal roles. And finally here, uh, this is the second last uh, slide where in uh, this idea of using education as a tool for resistance and how in, uh, they consider that education was important has been used here uh, again using popular icons and uh, the the idea of uh, the quill the pen being uh, mightier than sword and uh, using ink and this uh, the entire statue of uh, uh, of of uh, Brahman uh, and uh, using that uh, with Hinduism uh, written on it and it being uh, the throwing things on the statue. It is followed by burning of, uh, of pages and finally in the end they uh, put in the poem by Savitri by Rice to learn and act. And in, this is the last slide and how throughout the novel they intersperse the narrative from slavery and cult uh, cultivators we have got with references to uh, contemporary newspaper cuttings, contemporary events, uh, the fight for uh, merit, reservation, 
uh, Mandal Commission and the 2007 reservation policies, the uh, problem or the issue of uh, the Slaughter uh, Act and uh, the, uh, the the child labor issue and uh, child and bondage that has been interspersed throughout the text uh, in uh, different ways. Sometimes in the form of a newspaper cutting or just a subtle reference in the form of a speech or a thought bubble. Thank you, Devika. Uh, actually, Devika didn't make me use any <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, the floor is open for questions. So, any questions? Yes, in your title, you use the word appropriation. And uh, I think it's related to the whole controversy around the publisher, Navayana, and uh, his publication of uh, uh, that he writes. Forward to uh, combat cards, uh, annihilation of cast. So uh, I, would, I wanted you to uh, maybe uh, elaborate a bit on uh, this uh, appropriation. Uh, the term appropriation or why I use the term appropriation? No, I just wanted to or know because, because you use it in your title of the paper, but you didn't really uh, uh, talk about it in your paper, so I. Why you use this term and uh, how you uh, uh, think this uh, work is the <coughs> act of appropriation? Okay. Uh, the, the way I perceived it as and uh, why I used uh, the term appropriation was because it was not just uh, an adaptation in a very, uh, in a uh, in a traditional sense, it was not just about Gulam Giri. It was also about, and it is not even a scholarly history of caste oppression. It is, all, it is about Gulam Giri, Jyotiba's other work, Cultivate His Whipcord, and bringing, bringing in his other ideas along with Savitri Bhai's account and role as well. So that is the reason why I uh, used the term. And I'm, unfortunately, I'm unaware of the controversy <coughs> surrounding case. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so it wasn't in that uh, right. sense. Okay. I'm just thinking of uh, why Sri Vidya and uh, Han selected this particular text for this uh, purpose. That's why. The second thing is both being products of Hyderabad and Rio. Right? And have had a different kind of a childhood and a familiarity with uh, comic books, etc. Uh, which is more or less you can see it in these comic books. So, I was wondering who is actually the imagined child who is going to read this or look at this? And uh, what kind of child? It looks like, assumes one is in English. Mm -hmm. That itself uh, keeps out 90% of the children from India who is going to access and have access to this. Uh, the second is uh, it also <coughs> uh, expects a certain familiarity with the comic books already. Yeah, it, it does. It does. Right? The, re the reader or the viewer has to have an additional knowledge of how to read it. Right. You have to come with that knowledge, that right. education of how to. So the language, to the text, the, yes. comment, the language of this illustration, mm -hmm. it's not easily accessible to everyone. Yes. Um, the third thing is that I would say the entire production of this book is very traditional, which is, I think, you are trying to say the opposite. In the sense, the, in the text, the images, mm -hmm. uh, there are many stereotypical images. Of this. Yes. The idea of the family, for example. And that is why I said why they selected this particular book, which is set somewhere in the past. And there are lots of contemporary uh, stories now available. One could have done that. So I think, I think it's deeply problematic whatever they have chosen to do and the way they have done it. Um, yeah, 
My, I mean, what I feel is uh, because uh, the, uh, the use of stereotypical images is a very deliberate act because uh, the very idea of a graphic novel or a comic book, you have a certain perception that this is deeply entrenched in the popular mass culture. Although there is a very different section of uh, comic books that uh, are that work in a very subversive manner or are counterculture like Moz or Persepolis. And here, uh, and sorry, yeah. And uh, the, the image of the Brahmin. Again, uh, they use two images. They have uh, uh, it's uh, the the Brahmin used throughout in one of the images that I've shown. It's in the last panel. With a suit and all transformation. No, no, no. Here, this uh, uh, here the uh, they give two perceptions: the Brahmin's perception, where uh, the Brahmin is shown in a very uh, fair-skinned and uh, a godly-like image with no hair and very clean-shaven. And throughout the novel, they use a very hairy, uh, monstrous kind, a grotesque, not monstrous, grotesque kind of a Brahmin pot belly. So they introduce this, uh, uh, this uh, discrepancy in one of the frames when they fuse uh, Jyotiba's perspective of Brahman and Brahman as a, as a figure of Hinduism and uh, here uh, and uh, Brahman's own perspective of what their image is. So that you, the creation of the persona is very deliberate. So they're using those popular icons but then they uh, use them in various ways. So sometimes they overturn it, sometimes it's in a very uh, satirical mode or sometimes it just used it for the sake of a stereotype so that one can introduce an interplay between the uh, the original and the adapted work. I'm saying that, just one second I'll take. The way the Brahmin is imagined in this text is problematic. That's what I'm trying to say because that image of the Brahmin is very unthreatening to the producers because their image of themselves is entirely different. Right? And the Dalits are actually engaging with the new, modern, sophisticated Brahman right? and the image of them. I think uh, one question that one might want to uh, ask would be who is the addressee of these books? Yeah. Who's the addressee of these books? It's in English. Yes. And it's uh, in a format which is not e easily available to, uh, you know, a certain kind of public. Uh, that, that would be one question. But the other question is, they're also invoking all sorts of uh, uh, visual languages. For example, they uh, they pick up uh, Eugene Delacroix's uh, image of, uh, you know, and, uh, and what are they doing it for? I think uh, not only what, are, what is the language that they use, who are they talking to, but I think more critically, we need to, I think, ask the question, what are they doing it for? What is the function of a book such as this. So what, uh, so what they do is, uh, throughout the uh, graphic novel, when they are uh, in contemporary time, they refer to modern urban yuppies, the privileged people who are anti-reservation, who are, so uh, they try to, uh, uh, you know, in a sense, it may seem one uh, uh, maybe uh, that they are trying to, uh, you know, uh, create this book so that the, uh, the the person coming from a privileged background can know that caste oppression does exist, even in twenty first century in an urban space. This book is centered for an urban milieu, and. Uh, 
also in their work they say that in in uh, in the afterword of the graphic novel they say that it's uh, it's a way to uh, kind of associate how jyotiba's ideas and especially ideas relating to education and gender equality the emancipation of women are still relevant today so trying to bridge that gap between past and present these are like some of the uh, ways you can uh, uh, address this uh, question so would you take this claim face value no 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 you you, you cannot you cannot take, you cannot take this who is maybe there is a difference also between the two books i mean between you know the one previously bimayana and yes, there is, there is there is a mean, difference in the, in the types of addresses. I mean, it doesn't target the same you know, kind of people. As well, so. Any more yeah. questions? Yeah. You made the imagination of that uh, urban upper caste person who is supposed to be enlightened by this and reformed. Sorry, I did not. Meet I'm you. saying the addressee of this. You're saying they are peace, the urban. Whoever is supposed to read this and perhaps at some point understand what caste is all about. Um, even that idea itself is very simplistic. I would say, because it's very value, no? It's not. Uh, it's not just that you know you can teach to people what caste is. That that is uh, yeah. It's, but it's not just information. This, that yeah. You can just yeah but this is something which they keep on repeating in uh, their own uh, discussions which have been introduced into the novel so i won't say this is my point of view i'm talking about this quoting from the from uh, the novel yeah. i'm talking about theirs, yeah. theirs perception. and all, yeah and that in itself is very simplistic way to approach it's very reformist that's why it's I would like to uh, come on with what you said earlier about uh, the stereotypes on Brahmins, etc. I think this book, uh, in a way, also tries to uh, um, put images on a certain, uh, you know, anti-Brahminical popular culture, which is full of the stereotypes. And I don't know if you remember uh, Kanchai Laya's book, uh, Why I'm Not a Hindu, the first edition, uh, the first maybe uh, with. She also has these uh, yeah, images of uh, a fat Brahmin sitting under a mango tree and waiting for the drops of the uh, <laughs> of the produce that the poor laborer is uh, right. juice yeah. fall in his mouth and <laughs> sleeping. Yeah. 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 All these uh, images, which is really part of uh, uh, people's humor, and uh, I think uh, in a way this book also uh, does justice to that. And uh, uh, I think voluntarily, in my sense. Uh, Creates those stereotypes to reflect on uh, on this uh, popular culture of uh, anti-Brahminism. Uh, so I think it's eventually the... that image of I will change in the second edition. Ah. Um, the same reason that it was very stereotypical. The second one is about uh, the, 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 there are it's true that there are a lot of these stereotypical images in the <coughs> anti-Brahminism, and that is precisely the secular citizen of India he is very comfortable with those images. Eventually, that is not going to challenge alienated life or dehistoricization in the Fair words. Um, the relationship between everyday life and capitalism's commodification of labor and the labor that was assumed here. Thus does the Japanese historian Harry Hartunian speak of the everyday as a temporality rather than a geopolitical. Space that the everyday is enabled by, yet distinctive from capitalist modernity, that exists within the time of capital as a distinctive form of materialization that is perceived as a kind of social unevenness. So, having done all of this stuff, uh, what I just wanted to offer up are a few um, examples um, as a way to think about how anti caste critique works. I have three short examples. Um, then, and to, to think about how anti-caste critique worked to demystify social life, since the contention of anti-caste theorists was that caste division, the caste order, was not merely a social arrangement, but that it was indeed a form of thought. Right? That it was instituted to stamp on the head. Right? We'll talk about it and say to stamp on the brains of the, of the lower caste. So the stamping um, is that this was a mode of thought. 
past division judgment as a mode of thought, indeed it was a kind of social abstraction along the lines of the property personhood relationship that was instituted by classical liberalism. The task of critique then was to challenge the misrecognition of social inequity as social order. So Foule usually explains this process as a naturalization of Brahmin dominance, which denies the Shudra Atishudras the very possibility of critical thought by means of this metaphor of stamping, imprinting, sitting or weighing upon the mind, the idea that something is sitting on the head. So I want to offer a few examples um, of how Foule begins to do this, just as a way to, as I said, suggest that there is a continuity between this insistent effort to think, um, to produce a kind of critical thinking by rethinking the domain of everyday life. And something that I argue in the essay um, also begins to happen in the way that these Marxist terms of class or labor actually appear as inadequate to the way that the body of class labor comes to be understood. So it is actually in a proliferation of naming of concreteness rather than of abstraction that this kind of thought begins to operate. And I think this is a kind of profound challenge to, to Marxist abstraction. Um, so Foulet's challenge to, to religion is well known, and I'm not going to go through this. I think I'm running out of time. Five minutes, maybe? OK. Um, and, and so and his effort to rewrite the history of caste as the history of defeat, of cunning, and of appropri uh, expropriation. But then there's the other aspect of uh, what Foulet tries to do, which is extremely difficult even for him. And this is to produce in the Shudra, the Shudras the capacity of persistent questioning and thereby self-transformation. And I think this, I really just want to highlight it. there's anything I want to highlight, it is that the project of intellectual emancipation is taken so enormously seriously that we cannot just reduce this to um, lower caste and Dalit's interest in education, right? We have to be able to separate something like institutionalized education from the quest for intellectual emancipation to be able to think thought freely, right? And this is Fule's project, in a sense. Um, so it's this latter project of actually getting the Shudra Ati Shudras to think and engage in this self-transformative activity, to think, to intellect. It is this latter project, the relentless examination of inequality in all domains of the social, where one finds it, that was eclipsed by the emergence of organized non-Brahmanism, right? Or one could say, with the rise of the politics and the political movement, because I think both of them end up foreclosing the possibility of this kind of intellectual emancipation. That part is well known. The other aspects of this uh, critique that I just want to quickly take up um, have to do with this notion of the concrete and of naming, right? So in places like Shetkarya Chasud, the cultivator's wood court, Fule will offer sustained accounts of the living conditions of the Shudra Tishudra farmers, describing how they live, how they eat, how they work in all of its sensible plenitude. He employs an exceedingly colloquial Marathi, but he will, you will find in that text common usages of cultivators, naming, and he goes on ad nauseum talking about their farming tools, their cooking supplies, food, clothes, and other articles of everyday life. Unlike a straightforward empiricism, which would make truth claims based on sensible data, Foulet pursues a kind of radical empiricism by attempting to use description of everyday life as a way of critiquing the social totality of caste life. Right? So, I mean, so it's this kind of complicated thing that Foulet is trying to do. And, it's, um, and I'll just give you uh, one quick uh, mention because it tacks onto something that other people pick up. So he is going into a long description of the life of a farmer. This is the moment of the deck in famines, of debt, indebtedness, debt bondage. And so, the, so debt becomes the way for fully to think about colonial capitalism, not the commodity. Um, and so he will talk about these indebted farmers, those who are constantly being expropriated from land um, and from their commodities, from what they produce. And he describes his household, um, you know, he talks about cattle and how these cattle are wretched and they're grazing in one area. He says a stream of water is flowing outside from the bath and it's formed of puddles swarming with maggots. Some of this water has trickled onto the bodies of a group of stark naked children assembled beneath the nearby white chaffa tree. They're foul with itchy sores on their head and snot falling from their nose. 
loses. This notion of a kind of deprived life right, appears again um, in a Pada poem that's written by the president of the Bombay Sri Soman Shemitra Samaj, Pandit Kondiram, who was influenced by Phule, who would also draw this imagery to communicate the continued effect of past horrors. And here he would argue that in addition to wearing the black thread, Mahars could own no new clothes or jewelry into the present. They dressed in clothes from corpses. They wore iron jewelry. They ate from broken clay pots and owned only dogs and asses, rats and mice. They would dispossess shadowy figures reduced to begging and eating food, unfit even for animals. The Mahars' condition is so deplorable that they come begging for the rotten food scraps that have been thrown to the cows, which even the cattle will not touch. And Kuntiram also ends with this powerful image of Mahar's children sitting on a dung heap, their bodies covered with ash, sores on their eyes, rags covering their buttocks, their stomachs sunken and empty. This excruciating richness of illustration and indeed a painful description um, it, it illustrates every corner of the cultivator of the Mahar's home life. Right? And it forces the spectator to grapple with not merely the substance of this life, but with its enormous deprivation, right? And so the description, in a sense, of deprivation, I want to suggest, is almost a kind of concrete critical thought. Um, and this is something that, you know, just to end here, um, I just want to suggest that this kind of description, we see this in Bagul as well, the notion of people who, and, and you know, his descriptions of the slum, of, of um, the violence of neighbors, um, the enormous intimacy and violence that accompanies people who are destitute, who have nothing, who are completely, uh, not really dispossessed, but in a sense kind of depraved, fully will talk about the madness. But you know, a lot of these difficult descriptions, in some ways, is also what the literature itself begins to move away from as it begins to actually create its own buildings from us, right? That is that we actually come into modes of respectability, into modes of being sedate and composed. I think this goes back to something that uh, came up, I think, yesterday um, uh, with, with um, Ravi's arguments about drink and, and forms of life. I think Manur, you had been talking about this too, and I missed it. Uh, but, but, but it's that quality of, of actually thinking about the concreteness of deprivation of this kind of burial. Um, that I think begins to function as a form of critical thought itself. And so just to come up to the, to the essay as well, what I have really been struggling to think about is how these forms of thought, um, I think actually are enormously indebted to certain ways in which Marxism makes available um, forms of abstraction, labor for instance, or class as an abstraction. Um, which actually allows anti-caste theorists um, a, 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 an experimental space <coughs> for actually creating a very different kind of a discourse of caste and class. Always sort of you know, engaging with the uh, discourse of class, but I think constantly aware of the fact that that is um, an incommensurable discourse or it's a discourse that's not good enough. Um, it doesn't do enough, in a sense, to get at the specificities of, of, of um, caste. So I think at some point I say that, you know, for a big good engagement with Marx, all he brings up the fact um, that caste cannot be encompassed by class. But you must always, and that's the difficult inheritance, if you will, the painful, the poison in the gift, that you must always act as if um, the discourse of class uh, might allow you entry into the universal in order to mark the many ways in which it disallows you. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's just so rich. Yeah, well, we have time. Wait, um, okay. Um, like you, I'm curious for what among those the millions of things mm -hmm. that you've opened up there, the audience would pick up on. What kind of questions do you have? Comments? Yes, thanks. Uh, it's really intense. Uh, um, I was wondering which. You do about the fact that uh, I mean, Ambedkar has a very diverse history it's written on mm -hmm. thousands of pages on so many topics. But uh, I think there's also one aspect of mm -hmm. his work which is very prominent and central is mm -hmm. his sociology of caste and his theory of uh, graded inequality. So, how does that fit 
into your uh, challenge to sociology and also in, uh, in insurgent thought and uh, also uh, regarding... Uh, that is like, what, what is the engagement with sociology do you mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, you, your, your statement that uh, yeah. you know, intelligent thought is, is uh, uh, defining sociological, <coughs> sociological mm -hmm. thought, so how do you integrate Ambedkar's yes. sociology into that? And also regarding Ambedkar's relationship mm -hmm. to Marx, of course he does engage a lot, but I would like to know, I mean, to me, he engages with Ambedkar in a very critical fashion, like, for instance, in his discourse at Kathmandu on Buddhism, uh, the Buddha of Karl Marx, he both acknowledges that Marxism and his uh, Narayana Buddhism have a totally convergent project because the aim is human emancipation, so both are very universal projects, but at the same time he does challenge Marx for his economicism, mm -hmm. and it's, in my opinion, I have the impression that Ambedkar's criticism of Marx is very much addressed to the later Marx, to the capital. And but do you actually find any reference in his work to the, the earlier, younger uh, Marx, like uh, the, so uh, the more Hegelian, mm -hmm. which is yeah, more yeah. Uh, congruent to uh, your reference to uh, uh, Rancière, yeah. that kind of mm -hmm. uh, political Marxism? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, should I respond or yes, okay. 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 Um so I think this question of sort of, you know, Ambedkar sociology, yeah, I mean I think, you know, um, he is both a thinker of his time and is constantly sort of exceeding it, right? So, you know, there is there are ways in which both the, the, the sociology, the graded inequalities, right? And it's something that he keeps coming back to. The nineteen sixteen text for him is actually I mean, he thinks he's actually nailed it. Right, and he comes back to it in uh, revolution, counter-revolution, and so on. He talks about that same argument that he makes there, and it is an effort, you know, an effort, I think, at that point, to bring together, if, you know, not so much constant class, but it's a way to bring together um, Marx and Weber. Right, it's it's the classic effort of critical theory to bring together something like a status economy or an argument about status, together with an argument really about material expropriation, and 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 I think. That's, you know, it's that incommensurability for him right from the start. He uses sociological language, which is to say he's marked by his time. You know, or you read his account of, of the Shudras or the untouchables, and there he is, you know, he's doing anthropometry. He is giving us, you know, he is taking anthropometry on face value and saying, okay, we've got, you know, sort of the long noses and we've got the shorter noses and we've got the spread of people and we've got the spread of human types. And we can actually, and he engages in a diffusionist theory and so on, right? So I think there's one part of him that is, you know, deeply actually influenced by an available language of sociology. Perhaps more so, as well, Du Bois and, you know, something like um, uh, um, Philadelphia Negro will do the same thing. He's extremely uncomfortable finding all of these African Americans hanging out on the street and practicing street culture and so on, because in an odd way for both Ambedkar and Du Bois, I think also that, that investment and respectability becomes very important, right? And they can't bear the idea that you're really going to have these, you know, kind of um, um, truly kind of, let's just call it <coughs> cheap practices. They don't like to see people hanging out in public like this and doing strange things. And Bitcoin's enormous discomfort with things like sexual servitude, right? Mm -hmm. The history of so, so, so in that sense, I think they are, that the moralism of that sociology is something they inhabit. And it's very interesting to read that because you both sort of see them being invested in it. And I think they're invested in it. It's not that they're always engaging in counter practices of reading, right? It's not reading against the grain. They're in the grain. They want to be recognized as sociologists. And then I think there's that other insurgent urge, if you could put it um, that way, which is that that category somehow can't stick. And this perhaps is why both of them are such experimental thinkers. I think Ambedkar is deeply experimental, you know, because he's constantly trying to find an adequate language and he can't find it. So he says, okay, you know, so we're going to do, you know, Weberian sociology maybe, because that's what I was partly trained in. And Marx was not relevant at Columbia where I studied, you know, not at all. Social democ democracy and so on, but not Marx. Right, so let me work with that. But let me see if you know class actually begins to make sense because it is a way to talk about interest, and you know maybe I don't want to talk about you know 
ritual stigma at this point. Then he has to do so. That experimental nature of constantly figuring out what's going on, um, that I think is is um, is something that marks them in their time. It also brings me to your to your other question, which is you know how are you actually reading Marx and Abedkar? And I think this is a very important question um, because I'm suggesting actually that we must behave as if Ambedkar had read Marx, right? Yeah. In some sense. So I, I take your point, right? Because the point that I'm making also is not just that we want to see all of the places where Marx appears in Ambedkar. Yeah. That's easy enough. I'm actually suggesting that there is something epochal to the structuring of an argument where we have to actually behave as if Ambedkar had read Marx in order to understand the nature of that. You know, it is almost like saying, and Marx, I think, begins to make that kind of an argument. Right? We must behave as if political economy had read and understood Locke in its most radical, you know, function or in its most radical manner, in order to understand what that thought was capable of doing. So I am engaging in that kind of a, a absent present argument. So I think your point is well taken. You know, like, is he really reading Hegelian Marx? <laughs> Is he, you know, is this Lukacian? I mean, you have to say that Fule is being Lukacian. Yeah, it's really anachronistic, right? So I, I, I am saying that we must behave as if Marx structures the possible discourse at that time. I think partly because, um, because of the way that I think Baker writes about capitalism or capitalist relations, which is deeply influenced by Marx. And you know, I, I offer that that argument in. in Say that, in a sense, for him, it's very easy to say, well, Ambedkar, you know, is actually not Marxist. He's not even radical. He's just a good liberal, because he seems to sort of suggest that you know the Nets have to come into wage labor relationships. But what's insurgent about that is to say, what does it make available? It's not about the wage. It's not about earning. It is that the entry into wage labor is the recognition of a form of personhood that can be universal, right? And, and that's the radicality, if you will, even in that liberalism. So I think I am, I will take a chance and I'll say that, you know, I'm, I am really saying that Marx structure is a possible critical discourse of the <coughs> um, I mean, we could give examples, and I've tried it in the essay as well. You know, people are reading Marx, this is what they're doing, the Communist Party. There's, you know, kind of Eastern Marxism, which is not Stalinist. You know, there is the Marx that travels and moves into literature. You know, there's all of that. But yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll take that provocative argument that for that time, we must behave as if everybody who was thinking critically had read Marx. If that makes sense. Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering if you again, going back to Marx and the Jewish uh -oh. question. <laughs> so, on the Jewish question that he takes up the relationship between state and religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and again, Fule also, mm -hmm. at that point of time, I mean, so both these thinkers, in certain ways, don't have to kind of engage, I mean, especially Fule doesn't have to engage with democracy in that sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marx also, when he distinguishes, I mean, uh, whether state should take up religion as a subject or not. In Jewish question. In Jewish mm -hmm. question. So, uh, now, when we extend it again to the idea of caste, mm. uh, so what the state in certain ways, when we can connect to the present day story where the state would say that it's secularist and um, it has nothing to do with caste, it has nothing to do with religion, mm -hmm. but the actual politics will happen in the realm of the civil society, mm -hmm. as Marx also would argue. Mm -hmm. So in the civil society, caste problems will go on and the state will remain secularist and in this typical moment we can see that till now the idea of secularism was Kind of Congress was trying to say that I mean, we have a secular state and so on, and BJP has kind of come and very clearly said that we have nothing to do with secularism. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, how do we conceptualize uh, democracy uh, and how can, I mean, so Ambedkar had to deal with the question of the nation and, I mean, and democracy for that matter because he had to be uh, present mm -hmm. in an era where the nation is going to be mm -hmm. fighting for freedom and so on. Mm -hmm. So, how can we think about relationship of democracy, secularism, and uh, caste. That would be one thing that I don't know if I'm making sense. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> we should be here for, you know, like a few days. But yeah, no, no, I, yeah, your point well taken. Yeah. <laughs> so, the complicated relationship. And yeah. then adding to a small, uh -huh. one more, uh, small uh, the, the women's reservation bill that came. Mm -hmm. So then we have this uh, very interesting photograph that came in most of the media, which was, uh, <coughs> 
photograph in which you have Sushma Swaraj from the BJP and uh, uh, Prindar Karat from the uh, CPI, mm -hmm. both more or less looking similar mm -hmm. with a large thin hand and, mm -hmm. and with uh, signs of victory. Mm -hmm. And in other figure, uh, figure you have Larry Prasad Yadav and Sharad Yadav and the others mm -hmm. who are in the realm of yeah. the provincializing caste itself. Um, so dominant, so so this is also an engagement with the project of provincializing Europe, which has been so important in um, Dipesh Chakravarti's um, arguments and his engagements with what he calls enlightenment thought, the difficult inheritance, the painful inheritance of enlightenment thought. A dominant reading of that project of provincialization would locate its concerns within a broader critique of Orientalism. However, Chakravarti's injunction to put thought in its place and to recognize its historical provenance. And therefore, also, the parochialism of something like democratic liberalism is predicated on the impossibility. Chakrabarti acknowledges, even as he resists European thought as a geo-historical universal. Ultimately, Chakrabarti acknowledges the poison in the gift of enlightenment, for it's this gift that places on the colonized the burden of living with incommensurable orders of abstraction, navigating between universal categories and resolutely stubborn practices of daily life. His argument. I would prefer a more viable strategy because I would like not to further provincialize what is already a deeply provincial conversation, I think, about caste, which actually allows us not to see the radical potential of anti caste thinking. I wonder if a more viable strategy lies in substituting the project of provincializing Europe with exploring resonant analogies between forms of life that go under the name of Dalit, Negro, subaltern, Lumpen, bare life. What are the consequences of replacing abstract universality with embodied claims on the universal? And returning to thought, how do we reject the equation of material deprivation with intellectual destitution? Du Bois's intimacy with Greek mythology and Latin liturgy, um, Fude's imagined affinity with the Emancipation Proclamation, and figures such as George Washington and uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, who writes about them as figures he knows. And Shariati's extensive engagements with German theory are fierce claims upon an intellectual legacy to which these thinkers claim as a matter of right because they are the dehumanized subjects of empire. Right? They offer us a global history then of dehumanization and of dematerialization. Um, du Bois rails against the dematerialization of race, for instance, and of negation. And Baker becomes the thinker of the non-Hindu, the negated subject, the outcast. She who does not figure in the account of the birth of caste, beginning with the dismemberment of Purusha, original man. And if you go back and look at Baker's account of the untouchables, um, what we actually see, uh, even more importantly than his effort to write a history of the, of the untouchable into the account, is that he actually notices that the untouchable does not figure in the original accounting of caste at all. And it's this enormous anger at the invisibility of, of, of the outcast in this account that um, he begins with. So perhaps it's in the context of enormous injustice, better yet of indifference, that naming and renaming becomes significant. Abolition democracy is one such name, which creates proximity between a specific history, American slavery, and a universal idea, democracy. Du Bois brings the terms into proximity in a pretty reflection on the grounding contradictions of American democracy, its historical entanglements with enslavement. That is, he is not going to allow democracy to get away with it just being democracy. Right? It has to be connected to a broader political struggle and a very specific historical project, which is a slave abolition. The project is deeply resonant of, the project, uh, of, of what Du Bois sets, him, uh, sets himself to do in the 1930s, to relate the historical failure of emancipation with the hardening of a capitalist order and with the emergence of racialized interest, for example, black and white proletariat who had begun, he argues, to form a caste system. And the use of caste in Du Bois's writings is extremely interesting as it is on the part of other African American thinkers um, in this period and a little thereafter. I see that in word and house. So we begin to see here the forgotten histories of caste and race. The one calling up and supplementing the other, each of them pointing to inhumanity at the very heart of political order. In his later writings, Du Bois would set, set himself a difficult task of addressing how race is refigured, a 
occluded and dematerialized by modern capitalism. He would set himself the difficult task of stretching Marxism while holding it accountable for the inability to analyze the racism of the white proletariat. So Du Bois and Ambedkar, and I won't go into Ambedkar because the essay actually talks about Du uh, Ambedkar's similar effort to both stretch Marx and finding Marx absolutely inadequate. Um, and then what he then produces is something uh, like abolition democracy, which is the caste class, right? That is the, um, that is, uh, the, the, the term or the form of life that actually cannot be subsumed under a, a governing you know, larger category of ID class. So Du Bois and Ambedkar speak about the time of law and legislated hierarchies. Ambedkar, as we know, is obsessed with Hindu juridicality. And of course, he ends his life as a modern money eponymous lawgiver by leaving his mark on the Indian constitution. And this idea of the mark, right, this permanent contradiction, and Ambedkar, uh, Ambedkar. Aniket writes about this, right, the idea of the mark that actually grounds the contradiction um, that you find in the, in, in the constitution. Um, this permanent marking is extremely important. It's something that Fule will also talk about, the imprinting on the minds of the Shudra, the Shudra order. But their time, the interwar, is a time of enhanced communicative possibility, current capital, and technologies of violence. So this time, their time of, the, of insurgent thought is something like the past or present, where the past haunts the present even though new words and frames of reference have altered that past, even secularized it perhaps, through the universalism of the new man, or Marxist utopia. Ambedkar's posthumous text, the Buddha and his Dhamma, or his engagements with Marx throughout his life, I would argue, finds a new origin for the history of caste and inequality, but in the aftermath of this egalitarianism. So here I want to suggest that historicizing the concept, whether of caste and race, was essential to people like Du Bois, Ambedkar, Fule, etc. But that it could not be autobiographical. By which I mean that to historicize caste and race did not mean history of the community. Right? And this, I think, is actually what is so remarkable in what they do, that they implicate an entire order, a structure, um, in writing and historicizing caste and race. Because historicism was deadly, right? That is, to actually offer a history of the community was deadly. Because the only place in the present for the subject marked by caste or race was as a sociological problem. With her very existence at risk of annihilation, So this project of, of sociology or anthropology is, 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 is deeply dangerous for them, um, which is why both of them have this loving, um, love and hate relationship with sociology. Um, Baker is, is uh, using people like Abu Tar, who writes about the laws of imitation. Um, you know, du Bois writes a famous essay called Sociology Hesitant. Um, and both of those are about thinking about these histories of communities as current contemporary social problems. Which is that if you write the history of a community, the only place that you can end up when you write the history of African Americans or others is to think about them as a sociological problem right, in the present. And so, in certain thought, we turn to naming, description, and to the experimental practices of Satishud, right, this wonderful word, truth seeking, as its particular mode of social critique. And I want to argue that this is what anti caste thought does, that it sets up a particular relationship to the search for truth, Satishud. The locus for inciting self-transformation was equally significant, and this, I want to argue, was everyday life. First brought into focus as a site of suffering, and later as a space for a critique of alienated labor, and finally as a form of life that challenged the labor theory of value itself could come into view. And it's this critique of alienated labor, and then the kind of uh, Dalit writing's challenge to the labor theory of value itself, this idea of deforming language of actually thinking through destitution that Bagul and Dasar and others really begin to put into place. That is, you know, we begin with the question of thinking about the everyday as actually a space for new ways of understanding social suffering, that we actually begin to think about everyday life um, and thinking about everyday life in, as a kind of uh, in its technical sense, I suppose, um, as a space that is, uh, that is both commodified and appears to be dehistoricized, so people like Lukács and others who think about everyday life as a very significant concept. So we begin by thinking about everyday life as a profoundly important place for thought, and I think this is what anti-class thought really does. It 
is just a way to think the everyday life. And then we begin to move into these other ways of thinking about everyday life and, and labor as we um, and develop, um, as anti-class thinking develops. So um, as I said, this notion of everyday life um, and of the everyday um, is, is um, something that's, that's, I think, an important concept. It's one that, for me, um, and for the trajectories that I'm interested in thinking about, is really developed by people like Lukács, by Lefebvre, by Simon, by Benjamin, um, who relate everyday with capitalist reification. Brandy, coffee, 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 coffee